Okay, enzymes are really complex because there's so many keywords that are involved in it. And even though the learning objectives look quite short, those keywords are so important, like catalyst, enzyme, denature, all these sort of things. That's what we've really got to focus on during this lesson. You've got to know these keywords really well. The first one being metabolism, which lots of people think is respiration, but it's actually the total of all chemical reactions. So it's all of them combined. There's at least 5,000 of them going on. Uh, luckily, we don't have to know all 5,000, but the key thing is it's just the sum of all chemical reactions in the body. You've also got catalyst, which is a thing that speeds up reactions, but the key thing is it doesn't get used up itself. You've got substrate, which is the thing that's being catalyzed. Basically, it's the thing that gets broken down or built up. And you've also got the active site, which is where the enzyme and the substrate fits together. It's the bit that does the work. The rest of the enzyme is kind of just the body of it that gives it a shape, but the active site is where the actual chemistry takes place. So we can put these keywords together and you have the enzyme there, which is the catalyst. You've got the substrate, which is the thing that's going to be worked on. And you've got the enzyme substrate complex there, a bit like building complexes, lots of little buildings all in the same area, building up this big picture. That's what's happening there. The enzyme and the substrate comes together and it forms that complex. And enzymes have got lots of different things they do. They either build things up, change molecules around, or break them down. Break them down is the most common. We usually take big things and make them smaller, but we can take those smaller things and build them into bigger things, or we can also just change the structure of the molecules so it has a different function completely. A good way of thinking about this is a bit like Lego. So you can break Lego down into its little blocks and then build it back up again, or you could just take bits off and put bits on again. That's exactly how enzymes work. In the Lego example, you taking the Lego apart is like the enzyme. You don't get used up in the process, but the blocks get broken down into smaller ones, then built up into bigger ones or vice versa. And this whole process is called the lock and key model because the enzyme is like a key fitting into the substrate lock and then it works within it and breaks the molecule apart or builds it up depending on what it's doing. One way of thinking of enzymes is a bit like a key itself, hence the lock and key. So you've got the body of the enzyme here, which is a bit like the barrel of the key itself. And then off of that, we've got the teeth of the key, which are different in each enzyme so they will work on different things so it's a little bit like the key to your house it'll only really work on your lock exactly the same way as enzymes will only work on certain things we're going to look at how they work later specifically but for now just have this idea that the bulk of it is made up of proteins but that active site there is the bit that does the work and that's unique to each one as you can see, I've labeled them up. So the active site is here and the body of the enzyme is there. That active site is key for breaking down the molecules. So enzymes themselves show quite an interesting effect when you see them on graphs. What happens is if we increase the enzyme concentration along the bottom here, the reactive act reaction will go up exponentially. It will follow it in a linear pattern, as you can see here. Basically, it will just keep on going and keep on going and keep on going until either all the substrate is used up or until other factors sort of take over. But in ideal or optimum conditions, as long as we keep on increasing the enzyme concentration, if no other factor limits it, the rate of reaction will just keep on going in that linear fashion. So I mentioned optimum just now. Optimum is the best for enzyme activity. So just think of it as ideal conditions. And the first condition we're looking at is pH enzymes activity depends on where they are in the body so enzymes in the stomach are designed to function in ph2 whereas ones in the rest of the body are generally around about seven or eight as you can see there and that optimum is really important for them to work at the best so it's pretty much just saying where they're working the best where they're working the fastest and what happens is ph can change the shape of the enzyme itself that's a bit like me getting your house key and dipping it in acid it'll burn away some of the teeth there changing the shape of it so it no longer will work in the lock or in this case you change the shape of the enzyme so it no longer has the active site in the correct shape so it can no longer bind to the substrate and break it down to the products there are other optimums we need to consider one of them being temperature 
as you can see from the graph, the optimum there is about 37 degrees, which is human body temperature. So our enzymes are designed to function best, work fastest at our temperature. So it's around about 40 degrees. It depends on different animals. Cats run hotter than humans, for example. But what happens is beyond a certain point, the enzymes will get too hot and actually fall apart. They will be destroyed. The correct term for that is denatured. So the point just below the graph there, where it's hitting about 48, 49 degrees, the enzymes are actually going to stop working because they're going to fall apart. They're going to be denatured. So that's a really important key term we need to consider, that denaturing of the enzymes. Word of advice, they cannot be killed because they were never alive in the first place. Lots of people think you can kill enzymes. It's kind of because they function like little creatures breaking things down and building them up we think that they may be alive but they're not they're just chemicals and you can't kill a chemical it's a bit like me saying i'm going to kill salt it just doesn't happen what happens though is when they get too hot the bonds break down and it loses its shape it effectively unravels so it can't form enzyme substrate complexes a little sort of fact that is actually quite important it sometimes appears in exams is just because we've said 40 degrees is the best for mammals doesn't mean it is for everything what we can see here is a thermal vent. It's in Yellowstone National Park. It's basically really hot in the center there, about 80 or 90 degrees. And they found that bacteria live in those environments and are adapted to it because their enzymes work at 90 degrees. There's also other organisms such as the snow flea, which is just about to appear. There it is, which works at minus 10 degrees. So its enzymes are designed to function below freezing point. In fact, if that little flea gets too warm, above zero degrees, it says I'm denature and it can no longer carry out respiration and it actually dies. And like I said, in those thermal vents, the thermophilic bacteria there, heat loving bacteria work about 90 degrees. There's really only a couple of other things we need to consider. The first one being substrate concentration. This literally means how much stuff we've got to work on. So if there's only so many enzymes at work, the substrate can only be broken down so fast. It's a bit like if I said to you, I want you to do two bits of work, you could probably do it quite easily. But if I said, I want you to do 200 bits of work, you're gonna find it very difficult. So I'm gonna to have to get more people to help you. And that's exactly the same with enzymes. They can only work at a certain rate. So as we see in the picture here, after a certain point, the enzymes will work quite happily, but as we, keep on throwing substrate at it the enzymes can only work so fast the only way we can increase this rate is if we give them more enzymes to work with therefore the amount that the, of substrate that can be broken down into products is limited by the amount of enzymes we've got actively working on them so it's quite a complex sort of idea but hopefully that makes sense and we'll look at the final factor in a few seconds i'll just bring up the notes there to help you the key bit there is in red they become saturated and the only way we can get the substrate to be broken down faster is if we put more enzymes in. There's just too many to work on, basically. Another way of thinking about this is uh, gates into an arena or something like that. So if you've got three gates working and three people arrive, they can move through quite easily. If you have any more people arrive, so let's say 10 people arrive, some of them are gonna have to wait. So the way we could get people into the arena quicker was have more gates open, or in this case, have more enzymes working to break the substrate down into those products. So that will increase the rate of enzyme substrate collisions. I've just abbreviated there for ease. The final point really reinforces what we've looked at already. It's as we increase the enzyme concentration, the rate of reaction goes up. This is assuming that there is ample substrate, there's working at optimum conditions such as optimum pH, optimum temperature. So it will show a linear progression on the graph there. So the bit in red is the really important bit. That's a good sort of key point to say in exams and then you can reinforce it with the follow-up bits there so at very high enzyme concentrations the substrate may limit the rate and a few final points to finish off on if you're scared of spiders i suggest you pause the video here but enzymes are really really vital for all life functions and some of the more interesting ones i've got as little facts at the end here the bioluminescent in fireflies and glowworms is actually caused by enzyme activity that bioluminescence is actually caused by phrase, which is the name given to the enzyme that emits light. It comes from Lucifer, as in the devil, who was whose name means the morning lord or the morning star. 
So it was he was the bringer of light. You've also got rather grossly flies when they feed, they vomit enzymes onto the food they're eating. So they actually like pad enzymes with that mouth part you can see there onto the food and it partially digests it and they suck the food up. Pretty gross stuff. And they also um, transmit diseases whilst they're doing that because they've got it on their feet or in their mouth parts and stuff. Because they don't just eat food, they eat other really unsavory things as well. And like I said, there's a couple of spiders at the end, but spider venom is very, very potent at breaking down physical matter. In fact, if people get bitten by a spider, it can actually necrotize the tissue, destroy the tissue by breaking it down. The bottom corner one there on the left is actually a funnel web spider. The fangs there are powerful enough to sort of bite through your thumbnail. They're incredibly potent. But the venom itself digests the prey from the inside. So they inject enzymes in, it breaks it all down, and they kind of suck the soup out. Pretty gross stuff, but pretty fascinating at the same time. Anyway, hope that helped. Thank you. Bye.